following some serious adverse outcomes in chest drain patients where there's been organ injury, it is advised that now all patients should have some form of three-dimensional imaging prior to the procedure, usually in the form of CT or ultrasound, except in dire emergencies where this is not possible. So once you've confirmed the side you need to put the chest drain into, using clinical and radiological assessment, you need to identify the landmarks. It's easy to identify the sternal angle, or angle of Louis, which marks the level of the second costal cartilage. So palpate the space just below this, and you can start counting down the rib spaces. Third intercostal space, fourth intercostal space. The nipple usually overlies this space. Fifth intercostal space. It's the fifth intercostal space you want ideally for your chest drain. So palpate your way laterally in the intercostal space and identify the next landmarks the mid-axillary line and the anterior axillary line. You want your drain to be between these lines and avoiding the muscle bulk of the pectoralis major. Confirm that the side you are going to drain is dull or hyperresonant, depending on the indication for the chest drain. It is essential to have a non-sterile assistant to help you by handing you equipment and later attaching the drain. You should take full sterile precautions when inserting a chest drain which should ideally include a sterile gown, gloves and mask. This is the kit you need to have ready. The Seldinger chest drain comes complete as a pack with all the bits you need. We'll talk about those in a bit more detail shortly. You also need a stitch to secure the drain to the skin, a syringe to draw up the local anaesthetic, something to clean the skin, some sterile drapes or towels to create a sterile field, a narrow gauge needle for infiltration of local into the skin, a wider gauge needle for infiltration of local into the deeper layers, and some gauze. The chest drain has an underwater seal and should be ready on the floor and filled with sterile water to the pre-drawn line on the side of the bottle. You should have the chest drain tubing ready to connect between the chest drain and the bottle. And lastly, a clinical waste bag and sharp spin should be by the bedside. Draw up your local anaesthetic and make sure you check the bottle for the drug name, dose and expiry date. Positioning of the patient is important. You want the patient to be comfortable, but you also want to open up the chest wall. The best way of doing this is to ask them to put their hand behind their head. Proceed with cleaning the skin, starting from the planned point of insertion of your needle and moving out in circles. Because this procedure can sometimes be a bit messy, it pays to have put incontinence or inco sheets around the patient, but also a sterile pad or something similar to catch any drips. Create the surgical field using whatever your hospital provides. The ideal drape is called an aperture drape because it has a small hole in the middle of it through which to do your procedure, but you can easily fashion your own. It usually helps to mark the spot when you examine the chest wall. However, always confirm the exact location before you start, as the mark can move a bit as the patient moves. Feel the rib and gently push your finger into the rib space above it. Always remember that you want to insert your needle above the rib below, rather than below the rib above. This is because you want to avoid the intercostal bundle that runs on the undersurface of the rib. Once you're happy with your position, warn the patient about a sharp scratch and infiltrate a bleb of local under the skin with the fine gauge needle. Swap to a wider, longer needle and pass through the space, alternating between aspirating gently and infiltrating a little local as you go. Aim above the sixth rib into the intercostal space, not below the fifth rib. If your needle touches bone, Redirect the needle superiorly into the intercostal space. You always want to be above the rib below rather than below the rib above to avoid the intercostal bundle running on the undersurface of the rib. When you enter the pleural cavity, you will aspirate pleural fluid. You've gone far enough. Withdraw slightly whilst infiltrating the local anaesthetic. Be sure to be generous with the pleural layer as this can be very sensitive. Continue withdrawing whilst infiltrating. So this is the Seldinger kit. Firstly, you'll need the scalpel to make a small nick in the skin. 
Then this needle will be introduced with a syringe attached. This syringe will be used to draw back to confirm a positive aspirate. This guide wire can then be threaded through the needle once the syringe is removed. Once the guide wire is in, the needle is removed. This is the dilator. It's used to widen the tract around the guide wire to allow the chest drain through. Be very careful. This piece of equipment used improperly is very dangerous. You only need to insert a very short length of this, only enough to dilate the chest wall. You'll find out exactly what this depth is when you insert that needle. Test whether the local anaesthetic has worked satisfactorily. If it has, make a small stab incision just through the skin at the desired spot. Introduce the needle introducer through the incision, perpendicular to the chest wall, aiming for just above the rib, in the same direction the local anaesthetic needle went. Slowly advance the needle whilst applying negative pressure to the syringe. Here you can see a flashback of hemoserous fluid confirming the position. At this point note how far in the needle is. It will help tell you how far you'll need to insert that dilator in a moment. Remove the syringe and thread the guide wire through the needle. It's crucial to never let go of the guide wire. One hand should be on it at all times. Losing it in the chest is not a good move. Remove the needle and thread the dilator over the guide wire. Remember this must only be inserted as deeply as the needle went. Insert the dilator with a slightly rotatory movement to help it through the tissues. Remove the dilator and thread the chest drain itself over the guide wire. Theoretically, for a pneumothorax you want to direct the drain apically, and for fluid you want to direct the drain basally. However, it is almost impossible to direct a Seldinger drain reliably, and it still usually works. Here it has been inserted to about 14 centimetres. Remove the guide wire. Then remove the inner stiff component of the chest drain, which was just there to help direct it. You can then attach a three-way port, and to one end of this, attach the adapter that will allow you to fit the wider bore chest drain tubing. Secure the drain with something like this, a silk stitch. You don't need to put an extra suture here, because the wound is only small, unlike the large bore chest drain, so you won't need an extra stitch to bring the wound together when the drain comes out. Ask your assistant to connect the chest drain tubing to the bottle, and then connect to your chest drain. When the patient coughs, you'll be able to see the fluid in the tube moving. Clean up the area and make sure all your sharps are disposed of safely. Make a dressing for the drain, like this one that won't allow the tube to rub against the skin. But most importantly, it must be airtight so that no air leaks around the drain. Check if the chest drain is swinging, which confirms that the chest drain is patent and in the pleural cavity. You'll then need to organise a chest x-ray to check the position, and ask the nurses to commence a chest drain observations record.